Welcome to our Masterclass Essentials course, which basically is a course where we show you teaching cases which will certainly boost your echo skills. So for who is this tutorial? Well, it's for all of you who already have some knowledge of echocardiography, but now want to take your skills to the next level. We're going to show you a few very important cases with teaching points that are going to help you in your daily clinical practice. So here is the first case. But first, let me introduce you to Scott. Now, Scott is a 35-year-old doctor who is training really, really hard to become a cardiologist. At times, he's quite frustrated because actually he trained himself in echocardiography all by himself. He didn't really study or learn echocardiography during his university education, and most of what he knows was kind of done by do-it-yourself kind of a method. Now, in the following tutorial, we're going to help Scott solve a very difficult case. And here is Mr. Fanconi. Mr. Fanconi is Scott's patient. He's a 65-year-old man, a very well-known regional politician, so he's kind of a VIP person, and has been neglecting his symptoms of chest pain and dyspnea for several months now. Now let's come to the third character. This is Professor Meanwright. This is Scott's boss. He's quite demanding, and he's actually expecting Scott to make the right diagnosis on this very important person. Let's take a look at the echo image that Scott is acquiring a four-chamber view. Can you make the diagnosis from this four-chamber view? Well, you might see something, but, well, I'll give Scott a very important tip. The image is just too dark. You need to improve the gain, and I'll show you why. First of all, every machine has a gain button, and I experience that usually gain is not increased appropriately, because if you do not increase the gain, you will get an image that looks like this. It's just simply too dark. You might have the blood pool dark, but you can't see the endocardial contour. So you have to use a mid-range setting so that you see what you're supposed to see. But then on the other end, you don't increase the gain too much because then in the high spectrum of echogenicity, you will not be able to discern the characteristics of the tissue. Basically, there's two ways of adjusting the gain, either by using the main gain button or the time gain compensation. My experience has been that the gain is usually set much too dark because people want to have the blood pool dark. Now, the image might look nice, but you're losing a lot of information. This is the four-chamber view that Scott is now getting. A lot better, don't you think so? Can you see what the problem here is? Well, take a look at the wall motion in the region of the apex. This here is the apex. And if you look closely, you will recognize that the apical segments do not contract normally. But is there anything else that you see? Well, yes, there is. But to detect that, again, I would recommend Scott to do a little trick. Let me demonstrate on a model. Now, if you have coronary artery disease, you obviously want to see the apex right here. If you perform a four chamber view, you're going to cut from bottom to top, right through both ventricles. However, and that happens quite frequently, if you have what we call foreshortening, where we cut not from the apex but further cranial, you're going to miss the apex. So what can you do? Well, the first thing is try to avoid foreshortening by going as far down as possible. And the second thing is, if you cannot avoid foreshortening, use a two-chamber view. Because in a two-chamber view, you have to cut through the apex. Scott, don't you like this image a lot better? Now you can see a very important pathology. Not only does the patient have a regional wall motion abnormality, but there's also a thrombus. Now, you might have suspected the thrombus also in the previous image, but here it is quite clear that there is a mass here right at the apex in the left ventricle. Let's now turn to the topic of thrombus and look at some other images that will help you to image such a pathology. Again, here is a four-chamber view on the left of a different patient. You don't really see a thrombus here, but if you rotate to a two-chamber view, all of a sudden it becomes quite clear there is a thrombus. What else can you do if you want to detect a thrombus? Use contrast. Contrast is so important, especially in this setting, because sometimes a uh, thrombus can look quite similar to maybe an artifact or maybe to a papillary muscle. But if you use a contrast, such as we did in this patient, you will see that there is a sparing defect right at the apex. This is the thrombus here. Here are some more examples and tips that will make you an expert in detecting a thrombus. What we're doing here is we're using a very atypical transducer position, which is very far lateral. 
Now we can even see the very apical portions of the ventricle and there you will see a thrombus in a very small, I would say, apical aneurysm. It's quite clear that there is a mass here and it's quite clear that this mass has a different echogenicity than the myocardium. I think in this case you would not even need a contrast. Thrombi can look quite different depending, for example, on if they're old or if they're fresh. In a fresh thrombus, what you will see is that the thrombus is usually very mobile and where you have inhomogeneous and echolucent parts of the thrombus. Now, this looks quite scary, doesn't it? Take a look at the 3D image, which shows you how mobile the thrombus actually is. But now back to our patient, to Mr. Fanconi and to the images that Scott is now recording. A two-chamber view, remember, we can see more of the apex here. This is the thrombus. And here, another atypical view. Now, Scott is imaging very much from a medial position, again, pointing the transducer down towards the apex and looking at the very apical parts of the myocardium. Right here is the thrombus. Now, this is a thrombus which is relatively fixed and it is, probably has a relatively low likelihood of embolizing. Still important to make this diagnosis. Just to be sure, Scott also performed a contrast study in Mr. Fanconi, and I guess if you look at this image, there is no doubt. We have a sparing defect right here. We see the borders of the thrombus very nicely. And if you look at the regional wall motion abnormalities, you will recognize that the apex is akinetic, which is also a very important predisposing factor for the development of a thrombus. Let's take a look at some of the very important facts you need to know if you want to diagnose a thrombus. First of all, you need to see the structure in several views. You should look at predisposing factors. We already talked about wall motion abnormalities, but in general, patients who have poor left ventricle function are at increased risk of developing a thrombus. You should be able to delineate the thrombus from the myocardium. Therefore, you cannot mistake in it, for example, for a papillary muscle. The thrombus can have variable characteristics. Mobile, I showed you an example already. It can be echolucent if it's fresh, or it can be inhomogeneous. And finally, use contrast because there you will be expecting a sparing defect. Let's take a look at a patient where the question is, does he really have a thrombus or not? A patient with cardiomyopathy, poor left ventricle function. Yes, it's a predisposing factor. This definitely looks like a thrombus, doesn't it? But if we give contrast, we see that this area fills. Why is that so? Well, because this is a truly an artifact and not really a thrombus. So you can exclude a thrombus with contrast. What about this patient here? Again, there's a structure here which looks pretty much like a thrombus, actually. You even have a wall motion abnormality. But if we give contrast, we can see that this is not a thrombus, but it's actually a papillary muscle. Again, a very important differential diagnosis to a thrombus sometimes not easy to differentiate. And finally, here's another pathology that might look like a thrombus. You again have a structure here in the apical part of the four chamber view, but there are no wall motion abnormalities. Actually, the ventricle appears hyperdynamic. Well, what is this? Well, it's endomyocardial fibrosis with an eosinophilic infiltrate there, a differential diagnosis to a thrombus. So here are some facts that you and Scott should know. First of all, Thrombi are more common in aneurysms and apical infarcts, and it does not necessarily have to be a large aneurysm. Most thrombi develop within two weeks after myocardial infarction. They carry a risk of embolization, which is in the range of 5.5%. If you have a thrombus, you should give the patient anticoagulation therapy for at least three months and then reassess them whether or not you still need to leave the patient on warfarin, for example, or heparin. But what about Mr. Fanconi? And how important were these findings for Mr. Fanconi? Very important, because now we know he has coronary artery disease, he probably needs to go to cath. We know that he needs anticoagulation therapy, and we know that we have to give him treatment to prevent heart failure. So a very important study for Mr. Fanconi and also for Scott. So I hope you got something out of our first case of our Masterclass Essential series. Of course, there's much more to learn, more to learn about thrombi, about how to quantify left ventricle function, detect coronary artery disease, but all of this will be part of our masterclass. In any case, 
we have a second pathology and a second tutorial that will give you even more tips coming soon.